This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 387 for Thursday, December 17th, 2020. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. A little bit different this year, the annual holiday round table was so big, I had to spread it over into two episodes. So we did one yesterday with Alistair, James, uh, Stephen, and Ryan Murphy was here. Uh, But this week, or this time, I guess, we've got Brock at Vola from uh, The Cat Volver on social media, where it matters, Megan Townsend and Lou Page. Uh, Megan is at O Megan Townsend on all the social medias, as well as Twitch. And Lou is at Busy Zombie Lord and the co-host of Zombies Ate My Podcast with Ryan Murphy, who I mentioned was just here last night. Brockett, how are you doing this morning, sir? Oh, good. I can hear outside my door a cat meowing as our child screams at my wife as she frantically prepares breakfast. So, you know, <laughs> 2020 that's yeah that's how it is but yeah i I saw a meme the other day that yeah i saw a meme the other day that had um uh babies are cute but toddlers are awful people (laughs) (laughs) they're essentially adults without any of the rationale (laughs) they could get they could get into some stuff oh boy good luck lou it's uh (laughs) yeah uh and 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 there is mr lou page good morning sir howdy I'll just be happy when I can get through the night without having to get up three times a night. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's a slow process, I guess. And Megan is here. Hello. Hi. I have a cat. Everyone's <laughs> talking about their kids. And I'm like, I have a kitten. Like, I don't All know. I feel kind of like. We got two of those here. None of the above. I slept in until eight o'clock. So <laughs> I did not have to worry about any of that. Uh, any of that. So uh, for those of you that are not um, familiar, I mean, I won't go over the whole thing from last night, but we do a roundtable on the show every year around Christmas time. It allows me to do a little bit of pre-recording so that uh, listeners have some extra things to listen to over the holiday break. Um, I did a lot of kind of my spiel last night about what I enjoyed most about uh, my nerdy experiences from 2020 and what I'm looking forward to in 2021. However, we do have a couple of emails uh, that we can kick things off with. The first is actually directed at uh, myself and Brockett. Um, the first email is from Caleb. You got me through the Breath of the Wild challenge run is the subject. Hey, Joel and Brockett and all. I just wanted to thank you for getting me through the Breath of the Wild three heart, no DLC, straight to Ganon run. If you're not familiar, Breath of the Wild allows you to tackle the final boss whenever you want. For me, the real heft of the challenge lies in the final boss, not so much getting there. The final boss is actually a boss rush of six bosses. And if you die at any of them, you must start back at the first boss. I took three or four episodes to finally get the complete, uh, sorry, to finally complete the challenge. It was really something to have you guys in my ear during the grind, learning how to beat this challenge. It turned something that could have been a grind or something that could have ground me down into something that I looked forward to trying again and again. Appreciate you guys. Keep up the good work. Caleb, P.S. Brockett might remember me. I had him on my role-playing podcast on our episode about Comedy Trailblazer Academy. Glad to hear him every once in a while. Without you and your podcast, Joel, the world would sorely be deprived of his entertainment. Much love. Um, Caleb, thanks so much for the kind words. I'm glad that you're enjoying um, the Citadel Cafe and that you're a longtime Brockett fan. Because that's how I met Brockett. Oh, I was a fan of, of uh, Brockett and Kyle doing Biggest Fan. And I knew Kyle from Starcast and his other stuff with uh, Garrett Weinzerl. So that's kind of like the the podcasting seven degrees of Brockett Bola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At this point, biggest fan is almost like the the Star Wars prequels, and that like, well, I guess not chronologically, but at this point, like if you were to follow the web of how everyone met, like in these circumstances, it's kind of like, oh, that was in the past, and that's that's that was there. It's it's uh, I, I enjoyed doing biggest fan quite a bit. It's it was great to talk to Caleb that one time, and he's a, he was a big fan. He was. I think everyone who has a show knows at least 
probably three people by maybe personal name or their or their handle. Uh, and Caleb was one of those that uh, Kyle and I recognized quite a bit. And he was very kind. He started his own uh, Dungeons & Dragons type podcast and Discord. And that's where he had pulled me and my friend Dan to do a comedy podcast a while ago. But uh, uh, his challenge run sounds insane. So anybody who knows uh, Breath uh, of the Wild. Uh, uh, yeah, be- better him than I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I I, I, can't, I haven't even bothered to finish that game yet. So, <laughs> well, you could try what he did and just go straight for the bosses, but uh, nah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, that's very kind. I think probably just even to knock off another topic, that's probably my nerdiest, coolest moment of 2020 is just being shouted out by an email on your shoulder. <laughs> um, <laughs> is uh, is really cool. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, thoughts from him, but uh, but yeah. Uh, I, I'm assuming he meant like three or four episodes of the Citadel Cafe. So that's like this year, they, the TCC has been longer. Uh, I've been recording in the one, one hour 15 to one hour and 30 minute range just because pandemic and it's been easier to kind of like have longer chats with people. And, uh, that means like, you're talking like six to 12 hours of, of the Citadel Cafe podcast in your ear holes while you're doing a a video game. So that's, uh, (laughs) I will say um probably uh if he did do that challenge run which i know at least lou and i have a sense of how difficult that would be if he did do it in under six hours it's really impressive listening to back to back uh you know settle cafes is quite a bit but oh boy that challenge in under seven hours that's that's i have hard enough time fighting the bosses with the equipment and all the other extra (laughs) stuff i can't imagine doing it with (laughs) without doing anything no he basically did the boss fight as the year 2020. Like he walked into the boss fight, like, uh, oh, screw it. We're just going to do this in the worst way possible. And that's, <laughs> that's what he did in a video game. I don't really enjoy boss fights that much. Do you, do you enjoy boss fights, Megan? Um, I think it depends on the boss fight. Um, see, I have, I haven't played breath of the wilds only because I want to, um, that might be something I try doing at some point, but I find open world games very overwhelming. Um, like I found Skyrim very overwhelming just because there's so much to do and mm. um, Breath of the Wild sounds incredible because it is open world but um, the fact that you don't have any like guide kind of is just like oh, this is, this is, I, I, can, I have free reign I don't know how to do that <laughs> I'm just used to having a video game tell me what to do and it's like alright I'll go do these quests um, I'm sure there's like you know side missions and stuff that you can do or like uh, achievements or um, tasks you can complete but breath of the wild is so open world it took me about two weeks to even get the hang of what it is it wanted me to do oh great okay <laughs> i don't know if i can do that no um, it literally yeah. like you start out and it kind of gives you this vague idea of where you're gonna go and what you're gonna do and it tells you mm. oh yeah you've got to find this thing and you're like because if not you're stuck on this one island okay and then next thing you know there's things that can kill you in one hit doesn't matter how powerful you are and, and and you have to kill some of these things to get what you need to get down and i'm like uh this seems really hard i think i'm gonna give up and then i put it down yeah. for like a week and i was like yeah no i'm not gonna go back to that and then eventually i did and i'm i, I think i'm one dungeon from the end wow but- see i find that very frustrating like when you you can immediately be thrown outside of your element in a game yeah. um it just i it, it feels to me, I like video games because there's like a like a sense of of completion, you know. Um, the yeah. numbers get higher, and it's very satisfying. So when you're immediately thrown in a, in a position where you're just like, "There's no way I can beat this," I personally get very discouraged and very frustrated. I'm just like, I, "No, that's not. It's not for me." Um, I, I, I got over my discourage by cheating. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> if you go on, <laughs> if you if you go on Amazon, you can buy fake amiibos. They're cards that have the amiibo. NFC chips copied over yes. into them and I right. bought I bought I think it, it came in a pack of like 20 and one of the things you can do in Breath of the Wild is scan those amiibos and it gives you all kinds of equipment and it's better than your starting equipment right and you can do that once a day oh, for oh dang card, okay for each card it cost me like 10 bucks for all the cards and so whenever I play it the first thing I do is like I I, I scan all the amiibos get all my gear and then I go on a run for the rest of the for the next seven hours, and everything right. I find is way easier than it is at the start of the game. Right, <laughs> I cheat. I would I wouldn't even have thought of that. Um, but no, to answer your question, Joel, there's been a couple of boss fights that I've really enjoyed in certain games, like the one that is immediately 
coming to mind right now is um uh Kingdom Hearts. Oh, I don't even just Kingdom Hearts. They have really good boss battles. That's so ironic. Um, I'm what? playing through the series. I was just right. I, was, I of all the things I was gonna say, I'm about to play three for the first time. I was like, I don't need to warn people. No one will spoil it. And you just brought up Kingdom Hearts, so I just want to say, just don't spoil three. But oh, I've no. been playing through the old stuff. Yeah, they're great. They're no, lots. Of they're great. They're they're wonderful because the the boss battles are very you know, they're they're challenging enough to to not you know feel like you know you can just breeze through it. But it's also, um. You know, it's 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 at a, it's at an appropriate level for you. So it's you know they can get a little frustrating if you're doing it. You know, like multiple times. I know there's a couple times I rage quit on, um, particularly Ursula in number one in the first <laughs> Kingdom Hearts. You have to fight Ursula from Little Mermaid, and there's like it's like it's in phases of three or something. But there's one phase that she has where it's like it it my brother and I tried like twenty times in a row, and then we put it down for like a month. And then we picked it back up again a month later and beat her on the first try. And we're like, okay, just need a break, I guess. But yeah, it's very, I don't know. It's, 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 it's good. I, I, I like them, but it depends on the sort, like if they set you up for success or not in the game. Like if, if this kind of yeah. throw you in the deep end that I find really cheap, but if it's a yeah. natural progression and you're able to, um, you know, grow and get stronger along with the bosses, and that, like as long as it's still a challenge but not impossible, as long as it doesn't feel impossible, um, that's I I don't mind it. I think it's it's a it's kind of exhilarating. I I kind of enjoy it. So my my most recent boss battle was in Borderlands Three. It was the first Vault boss, the uh, big creature thing Joel. that comes out, and I I didn't mind the fight. It was kind of it was pretty straightforward, but it was a lot of running around and had some big, like, kind of like the ceilings coming down moments kind of stuff. Um, it was the post boss battle story happenings, which I won't get into, but like it really kind of ripped the rug out from underneath because I thought it was dumb. Uh, and so I haven't actually returned to the game since. Not I've noticed. that I don't want to. Not that I don't want to, but it's it's I've just had other things kind of creep up. We've had a lot of snapshots with Minecraft, and so I've been back into Minecraft and doing other things, and I just haven't had the time. Um, but speaking of Minecraft, Minecraft Dungeons, uh, a dungeon crawler that has some pretty um, serious boss fights in it, and up until the last boss, I found them pretty good. Like I would very often die the first try, but then you kind of get a handle on the pattern or what you're supposed to do or a decent strategy or you change your loadout and then you go back in and you're, you you end up winning. So you're like, well, I don't mind losing if I can go in there either. Uh, like if I can, if it takes me three times, that's fine. When it takes me like six or eight times, like um, Kilovolt was one of the boss battles in Borderlands 3 to go back to that. That I found very frustrating. I think I died like six or seven times on stream and it was just like, sometimes there was just like, well, he's electrocuting the whole floor. You can't escape it. You just basically have to not have so little health at this point that you die. It's just that I find that kind of stuff dumb. Yep. And with the final boss battle in um, Minecraft Dungeons, it's on a pillar. And so there's places to be knocked off and or fall off. So it does not matter how good you are, how much gear you have, how much health you have. If you just get hit the wrong way, or in my case jump and land on something that you feel you should have landed on but then the game says nope you actually missed that and throws you into the void and you die that i'm just like nope i don't find this fun anymore like this is not you know or if when you beat the boss it changes into something else completely different with a completely different attack pattern and just kind of like blows everything off the pat platform and if that's your last life well then you're done you're just like no, it took me 10 minutes or 15 minutes to get the boss to the second stage. Like, I don't find this entertaining or fun. I just find it punishing and like, you know, like when you're going up a big hill and you turn the corner and there's just yet another big hill. It's like, no, I just, I, just let me, I mean, I figured out how to beat the boss. Let me beat the boss. And so I don't find that kind of stuff. Give me fun. a break, um, right? It's kind of like just yeah. punishing is a really good word for it because yes, when it, when it, when there's just so many things stacked against you, it just doesn't feel rewarding. So mm -hmm. you summed it up perfectly. Hades has excellent boss battles. If anybody's played I've that. heard that. So good. I it's so good. I haven't played the... it, but my roommate has it and it looks beautiful. The voice acting is amazing. The sound design, incredible. And it is very well format. It's, it's yeah. so, I love it. I love it so the, much. The first time you play it, when you get to the first boss, you just have to assume you're going to die and it's going to make you start over. 
But then when you get to him like the second or third time, the game is balanced enough that at that point you've unlocked more stuff. So when you get to him like the third or fourth time, you can probably beat him, beat the first level boss. And then the strat- the, the struggle happens going into the second world and trying to get to the second boss. And there's four bosses total. Uh, I've been playing the game for weeks, if not months. And I am still only able to get as far as the third boss. It kind of goes along with the story, though, too, right? Because it's like the story is you're playing as, I don't remember his name, but it's like the son of Hades and Uh, Persephone. Yeah. And you're trying to escape hell. Yeah. You're trying to get out of, yeah, get out of Hades, essentially. And so you're, you know, a, a prince who doesn't really have a lot of skill. So he's, he's, he's learning to grow so he can survive out of, Hades, essentially. And so it, it is there is sort of like a narrative reasoning behind it, which I think is really interesting. And uh regularly the other gods are giving you powers and other gifts to help you get out of there. And you can actually communicate with them. And they're like, Come on, you need to get out of there so you can come join us up on Mount Olympus. And your character's like, I'm trying. Stop it. <laughs> it's very good. It's I highly recommend. I def I haven't played it yet, but um i absolutely want to give it a go because it looks so good so good it's really good so last night with the uh, the rest of the holiday roundtable crew i posed the question what was your either nerdiest moment or most favorite nerdy memory from 2020 so megan we'll start with you looking back over 2020 what was the the nerd highlight reel for me personally it's chira and the princesses of power i was very very pleased with the resolution of that show i've been following it since it's come out and um just you know emotional and dramatic in all the right ways just really fun um nuanced and well-performed characters very satisfying conclusion really great character arcs and just um it's not often that i walk away from a show feeling very fulfilled um there's always something missing it's the first time i felt like fulfilled i'm like yep yeah, okay i can i can put this down and be happy still would like more of it i you know i think it's definitely worth exploring more but i'm walking away feeling satisfied very satisfied and that doesn't happen very often um and uh i know that um brocket i think yeah brocket you mentioned uh queen's gambit so i'll let you or someone else mentioned queen's gambit i'll let you you do that but um queen's gambit was also very good this year and uh i've recently started doing a rewatch of adventure time and that has been like a really you know nice bow on the end of my year because it's just such a feel-good show very quirky just easy to watch easy to throw in the background um but it's easy to just sit and watch multiple episodes in a row because they're so short and um i don't know it's just it's that's it that's pretty much it rocket what about you what was your uh highlight from from 2020 whether it's media or books or just something nerdy that you did oh well, it's it's funny so it's weird that you brought up kingdom hearts the wood game franchise i was rediving into uh earlier megan and then that the whole announcement with disney because honestly i've been in a huge disney slash cartoon dive probably since the half point of this year on um and i uh a lot on the same lines of Shira and um and uh adventure time i've gone through and rewatched some of the cartoons i felt i really enjoyed or ones that i hoped were on the same wavelength and for a long time i've been working on joel for two things and he's played borderlands 3 and sounds deeply disappointed in it so that's that's harsh but it's fair uh and, but the second one that i truly hope joel eventually enjoys and anybody else uh, is Gravity Falls, which only has two seasons, and it's I done. love Gravity Falls. It's amazing. It's, it's so it. fun. Yeah, exactly. See, Joel, you got three people, all three of your round tablers. <laughs> Four. J- James last night has uh, off mic uh, recommended Gravity Falls as well. Oh, it's just, and I think everyone can, uh, I hope can mostly agree, like, it's a really tight, like, I rewatched it. The first season has a little bit more, like. it. It's, it, it takes about four episodes for it to start rolling. Yeah, yeah, there's a little there's a bigger through line I think that develops l- late in season 1, but yeah, I think 
rewatching it, it was funny just to laugh out loud at a cartoon that I'd watched years ago. And I, I that doesn't happen to me a lot where I get caught um, off by old jokes again. But my, my wife's cat is named after the, the main female character. Her name is Mabel. So, oh, nice. Yeah, no, it's it's a great show. And rewatching that was a really nice segue into some other stuff to catch up with. And uh, th- um, Disney has a new show, I believe, from XD their stupid side thing um but uh it's called the owl house and that's on disney plus it's only one season so far um and it was quite lovely it had a lot of the vibes i will say of what i've seen of adventure time gravity falls uh show uh i'll get to later but um yeah it's it's great the basic premise is a a human girl gets into a wacky magical world and loved growing up reading essentially a a magical witch story. And so when she goes into this world and she finds a magical witch, she clings on to her for like a fangirl and basically doesn't let it go. And you have quirky fun characters in this world and it's a full season. It has an overarching story for season one. Uh, Season one does end in a way that's essentially kind of wrapped up, but also cliffhangery. So it it definitely has a lot more meat on the bones, but it it, it also is kind of like, like if it was, if it got canceled, I would be very disappointed because there's obviously a lot of of rich lore that they've laid out amongst the fun of season one. But uh, I highly recommend the Owl House on Disney Plus um, or Disney DX, but the best way to watch is on Disney Plus. And uh, that's like one of the fun new not new to me, but new in 2020 shows uh, that I recommend besides um, what Megan threw out the Queen's Gambit. But I think that's been brought up on the show before, but I'll just redouble down. Like that was a phenomenally amazing show that moved so many units of chess and online chess <laughs> and chess books. And when you could do that as well, I mean, people are shut in, but when you could do that, you've done something to the culture and that's, <laughs> impressive That's i have cool. a friend who's now watching chess tournaments online during the day <laughs> and i'm like i'm like yep you you've watched too much queen's gambit <laughs> i don't remember the source i believe it was a canadian chess club but uh one of the things that they had mentioned with their membership was the increase of uh, women wanting to play chess which i thought was cool too as a result of a lot of people being exposed to the queen's gambit it's great. They do a, a great job of, of laying out uh, the game of chess and making it um, interesting. What about you, Lou? Looking back over 2020, what was some of the, the nerdy highlights? Uh, well, for me, uh, my, my personal biggest nerdy highlight was uh, I actually beat from scratch a game of Slay the Spire. And if you've unlocked the special final boss in that game, you understand how hard that is. Um, mm-hmm. It took me months. And uh, I didn't even realize I won the fight until it told me the gate fight was over. Um, it's a card battle game in which the final boss deals damage to you for every card you play. Oh. And so it becomes a countdown of like, you're going to die in seven turns. And somehow I magically used some kind of card that meant that every time he dealt me damage, I dealt him seven more damage. And I thought I was about to die because I was down to like my last two or three hit points. And it says, oh, no, you won. And the screen went black. And so I didn't know I won. It goes black when you die. So I'm like, oh, I guess I died. And it comes back and it was like, you've won. And I'm not joking. I was sitting on my couch with my laptop in front of me. I jumped up from the couch. I danced around in a circle. I was like (laughs) screaming and hollering. And my wife is like, you're going to wake the baby. Shut (laughs) up. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I won. I won. I won. I won. I won. I won. And she's like, okay, I understand. What did you win? And I'm like, I finally beat Slay the Spire. And she's like, that stupid game you've been playing every night while we watch TV for months. And I said, yes, I finally won. I won. I won. I won. I won. And she's like, okay, calm down. I literally emailed a bunch of my friends who have played the game. And I'm like, I won. And they're like, yeah, we gave up months ago. And I'm like, I don't care. I won. <laughs> My boyfriend plays uh, Slay the Spire and he's been like, you know, gradually trying like all the different characters you can do. And um, I, I think, I don't know if he's given up, but for him, it's more of just like, a, you know, a sort of like meditative kind of game. Uh-huh. He doesn't really get into it to, you know, like try and if he wins, nice. But it's more of just, you know, let's, let's, let's see how much focus and strategy I can do with this. 
Um, and he really likes it, but I, I don't know if he's actually heard of anyone winning before, so I'll have to pass that along. It, it's it, it's become my game of dealing with the baby. I never know when I'm going to have to get up and walk away to go change a diaper, feed the baby, settle her down. It Everything is turn-based, so I can get up at any point, in any moment, and just walk away, mm-hmm. go take care of the baby, and then come back and pick up where I left off. So that's mm-hmm. kind of become my game of 2020. <laughs> And uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same things you guys have all covered. I mean, I've been watching the same stuff. The Mandalorian's been awesome. I'm eager for this week to uh, uh, catch the finale. And uh, last night, uh, the first three episodes of The Expanse Season 5 came out on Amazon. Uh, I started that last night, and that's good so far. Uh, That's based – that first – this season is based on my favorite of The Expanse books. So I'm excited for where, to see where that's going to go. James last night was talking about The Expanse Season 5, and he's been reading the books as well. And uh, one of the comments that he had was that he likes some of the changes that the TV show makes from the books because it makes for better TV. Yep. Yep. They've added a few characters that didn't exist in the books. They've changed a few of the characters, and some a few of the characters that were the bad guy aren't the bad guy, and some of the characters that should have been the bad guy in the books are the bad guy in the TV show kind of thing. I did enjoy that show. I just kind of, I think I just fell off. I think it was just, you know, either just just pandemic stress or just, I ended up just watching a lot of very light things um, early on this year. And so in the process of catching up on the expanse, I was, it just kind of fell off for me. Not that I didn't like it. It just, it was just a mood thing. It is. It can be a stressful show. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's intense. Like it's a good drama, but it's like, if you're not willing to handle that, (laughs) then you're just like, well, maybe now isn't the time. And that's the nice thing about these streaming services. Like, I mean, I use Amazon prime for shipping. So like I have access to prime video. That's not going to go away anytime soon. So um, I'll, I'll, I can always return return to it when I want. It's like um, Tales from the Loop. I only return to that show when I'm in the mood for it. I find it slow. Sometimes in the I'm in the mood for slow. Um, other times I'm not. So I just I kind of been going back and forth to that and going back and forth to a few other things uh, as I see fit. And I mean, actually, that's probably a good point to mention about Borderlands Three is that everything else about the game I've liked and I've just not been in the first person shooter mood but when i am that is what i will be returning to because i like everything about it except for that last story beat that i just had which isn't the end it's only like a midpoint so maybe it's not even the midpoint it might be just act one but yeah i don't yeah you have a lot you have a lot of game to go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So, so I will, I will get back to it, and that's the thing, uh, and kind of leads me into what I've, you know, been looking backwards over uh, for for 2020, and for me, it's been streaming, which I did, I did mention this last night, but I'll go into like of a different angle, um, because of the popularity of Minecraft and the spawn chunks. Thankfully, knock on wood, um, a lot of what I've been streaming and a lot of what I get attention for from streaming has been Minecraft over the last couple of years. So this year I was working hard on, um, I would say working hard, but I was very interested to see if I could expand into other games and get streaming um, traction and maintain the audience and kind of introduce the people to just say like, look, I don't want to just be a Minecraft streamer because I have other interests and I have other games uh, that I want to play. And um, between No Man's Sky, Satisfactory, And Borderlands 3, I kind of expanded into different genres uh, of adventure. You know, there's sci-fi, there's um, a little bit more of, um, you know, first-person shooter stuff. Like, I kind of went into a bunch of different stuff. Now, Satisfactory and No Man's Sky are both sandboxy and building games, so they kind of speak to that Minecraft mentality. Uh, They're all pretty chill, except for Borderlands. Borderlands is not super chill. Um, So that was an interesting experiment, but it was also... It's it's a it's just cartoony and silly enough. I mean, there's some adult language, but there's enough fun, I think, in Borderlands that it's not taken too seriously. Uh, so there's a lot of like, what the heck just happened, you know, with the <laughs> chat and and that kind of stuff. I found really fun, and it was nice to see that the community. I mean, obviously, there were lower viewerships for the other games because Minecraft. I find the Mi- Minecraft audience can be very focused, and if it's not Minecraft then as much as they like you and Minecraft, they're just going to go find somebody else streaming Minecraft. That seems to be <laughs> what happens. Um, but a number of people that have been in my community now for a longer time are like, well, actually, let's hang out and see what's up with this No Man's Sky or let's see what's up with um, with um, 
with Borderlands 3. And so that was really fun. It was really fun to stretch those legs. And it has me thinking a little bit more about 2021. And I'm jonesing for something meteor in a video game experience. Like I'm looking for like a Mass Effect or like a Skyrim. I mean, I haven't actually played um, Skyrim. So um, I might, I mean, I'll have access to that when I eventually get an Xbox and have um, Xbox Game Pass. So that might be something. But I'm looking for something of that kind of like ilk. You know, a, a couch story experience, something I can dive into and just spend some hours, you know, doing something cool and immersive um, that's separate from, you know, Minecraft and other stuff. And so I'm looking forward to to trying to get into some of that kind of thing because I did miss some games over the last six eight years with the other um, the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. I didn't participate in any of that stuff, so I missed all those. Um, so in terms of story, I find myself being pulled more towards games than I am towards media that said there was an awful lot announced uh from disney last week and uh i feel like it's uh i definitely want to get your views and opinions of what's uh what's coming because i think that it's it's a lot of what i'm looking forward to from a media perspective in 2021 is is coming from disney plus because they own so many things (laughs) um but we do have an email from Cosmic. I read this last night and I'll read it again today because it's a, it's a really fun email and points towards the future for our nerdy entertainment. Uh, hello, my favorite bunch of nerdy folks. I hope this email finds you well. Me, I'm just having to have a lie down after catching up with all of the Disney news that recently announced. Seriously, I had to watch it over a couple of days because there was so much to take in. So now that we have had time to hopefully absorb all the news, I'd love to know your thoughts. What are you looking forward to? What are we shocked to see announced? Anything you're not looking forward to? I'd list what I'm looking forward to, but there's too much to mention. For what it's worth, I'm not feeling the need for another Indiana Jones movie. Overall, I'm looking forward to the expansion of the Marvel Universe and the Star Wars Universe and seeing where these go next. Hope you all have a wonderful festive season. Wishing you all the best in the new year. If anyone asks, let's just deny all knowledge of 2020. Cosmic. Uh, So again, thanks for the great email, Cosmic. And... um, I, there's a link to the Verge article, the 52 things announced by Disney, <laughs> uh, which actually is a pretty decent reference because they link out to other more specific stories. So if there's something you want to know more about, you can kind of dive in. Um, the things that I mentioned off the top of my head last night were uh, Hayden Christensen returning as Darth Vader in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Um, see also The Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader. Uh, I, that was a great book by James Lucino. Uh, if they hint at any of that, it'll be an interesting thing. The Ahsoka spinoff and the Acolyte, which is set in the High Republic era, uh, also piques interest. Um, I enjoy Patty Jenkins and her Wonder Woman uh, endeavors. And so having Patty Jenkins uh, direct a Rogue Squadron film uh, sounds like a Top Gun in space with X-Wings to me. And I am on board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah i mean that's that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of what i'm looking forward to it's I've very much been a star wars focused thing for me because i think star wars at the end of 2020 has been a focus for me as well something that i've really enjoyed the the series that i've enjoyed the most have been like the end of the clone wars and the um latest mandalorian season both of those just really stand out in terms of like what i enjoyed from the year and so i'm looking forward to more star wars stuff and I like that they're going mostly series. Um, Star Wars films are not coming for a while. Uh, and they're giving the the cinematic universe, I guess. Well, I mean, it's all one universe. But they're giving Star Wars and theaters a rest. Uh, I would imagine for two reasons. One, uh, the films that came out recently were not all wonderfully received. Uh, and they just, with the pandemic, like, why not focus on Disney Plus? I mean, the projections for Disney Plus were... I think it was set for 2024 and they met those projections this year in terms of adoption. So they're not doing too shabby and it's nice to see them investing in a number of new series across Marvel, Disney, Pixar, uh, Star Wars, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Because uh, in Canada, Disney Plus is going up by $3 a month, which is uh, not a small increase. It takes it up to near Netflix prices. Netflix is around $16 or $17 now, and this will put Disney Plus in the $12.99 or $13.99 range. So there is that. In in America, it's only going up like a buck. Yeah, and I don't know why it's going up for three in Canada because that is not the exchange. Like, (laughs) it should go up $1.50 if that was the the case, right? Yeah, 
looking ahead to all the different things that are coming from from Disney Plus and and whatnot, um, Megan, do you have anything that you're looking forward to in 2021? Oh man, like Cosmic, there was just so much going on that like I I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around it. But I did watch um, the trailers for WandaVision and Loki. Um, I've always liked Loki as a as a, a character. Um, and I don't know if that's just like, you know, I think Tom Hiddleston is a fantastic actor. Um, so I'm just excited to be able to see him play with Loki more because you can tell that he has a lot of fun with the character. Um, so that's kind of the the primary thing that's on my radar. But all the all the Star Wars stuff, I still have to get through the Mandalorian. I've kind of like started and stopped multiple times. I've just been having a hard time sitting down and like focusing on it. I just I don't haven't really been in the mood for like a space western. I guess so. It's mm-hmm. been hard to like sit down and like you know fully absorb it. Um, if you don't mind me asking, where are you in the Mandalorian so far? I've like started it over like four times already, so I'm on like episode oh, three of the first one. season. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, it's just no, like I've just been having a hard time like sitting down and really absorbing what's happening for some reason. Um, I won't get into it too much because it little it'll you know I have I have some thoughts and opinions, um, but I, I I don't know if it's. Um, just it's just not vibing with me or if i'm just not in the right headspace to watch it but i've been having a really hard time getting into it and not that it's it's not good i just for some reason i'm just not i'm not fully in it yet and i haven't quite figured out why yet um i'll get there i'll get there eventually um i mean anything by patty jenkins i'm so excited to see because again i i love her her wonder her work with wonder woman and you know she's going to put a lot of care and attention. She puts a lot of care and attention to what she does anyway. She's kind of proven that as a director. Um, so anything she does with Disney is going to be amazing. Did you see that Haley Steinfeld is going to be in the new Hawkeye series? She is so good. So I love good. her a lot. She's she's yeah. very very excellent. I really liked her in um, Bumblebee. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I thought that, that was good. Yeah. I just I feel like they're doing a lot in the marvel universe right now for lead female protagonists you know like yes. superheroes like there's mm-hmm. she hulk there's um iron heart mm-hmm. um, i'm pretty sure she hulk is going to be a cg character because uh the woman playing uh she hulk is not that tall yeah t- well Tatiana, but but i think that yeah but is she so i don't know from the comics is she hulk hulk all the time or yeah, she yeah. go back she forward? never yes. changes oh yes. okay so yeah so then it'll be a cg thing but that's cool i mean like i i mean for for what it it lacked in a plot i thought the acting from alita battle angel was good and that actor looks nothing like the character a little yeah. bit but not not they really didn't stick to her yeah facial features they kind of made alita her own thing and i thought the acting on alita was very good in terms of like cg motion capture and all that kind of stuff so um i'm on i'm on board with that um i'm trying to think of another situation i guess the last time i saw anything like that just specifically with a female lead would have been i don't remember the character's name but it was um zoe zeldana from uh avatar um what's the name of the character she plays uh natiri Natiri, right. So I thought Natiri's like facial acting and stuff, and this was years ago. Technology has come quite a bit since then. And I enjoyed that quite a bit too. Because she's such a good actor. And and mm-hmm. you just you get you get it. It comes through. Like once you realize who it is, you can sort of see the mannerisms and stuff like that kind of coming through. Um so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to, to She Elk. I think that could be a lot a lot of fun. There is something here that was announced after this that um is coming to Disney Plus. And I believe it's coming next week, or the, it's coming the week before WandaVision happens. Uh, there's something being called Marvel Legends that's coming, and every episode is going to be a flashback, and it's going to be a clip show, so that you don't have to rewatch a bunch of movies to figure remember who Wanda is or Vision. It's going to be like a clip show, so that you get the gist of who their characters are and what movies they were in, if you want to go back and watch them. Nice. Oh, I'm a sucker for that kind of crap. I actually uh, but, liked some clip shows back in the 90s. I'd be like, oh, my favorite mo- before, you know, before the internet with YouTube, like that was the only way you could rewatch some of your favorite stuff before you bought the the tapes or v- DVDs. So that's how, that's honestly, I think, a very smart move for the millions of households where the 
mom and dad are like, what the hell are we? Who's kept? I forgot who Captain America is. Yeah, like, and then you're you gonna know, watch, some of those people. You're gonna watch this, and it's gonna be a highlight reel of their movies. So yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, no, and and I think too, it 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 helps bring people that are new to the franchise. Like I know a lot of people that are not necessarily Star Wars fans. They know of it from pop culture, but they're really enjoying the Mandalorian. And the Mandalorian, to to quote my my friend Garrett Weinzerl, uh, uses every part of the story of Buffalo. And so the 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 Mandalorian at the start of episodes will say previously on the Mandalorian, but they're pulling from like season one clips from season one and and odd little bits uh, from characters and then they do like the current episode so they kind of bring you up to speed and that helps a lot because like it's been a year and change since you've watched this one little hour-long drama you know as as much as people enjoy it like it's nice to have those kind of little refreshers um with regards to the marvel properties actually while we're on that uh miss marvel uh, is one of the ones that are, are coming out. Do you, um, Brock, and I know that, uh, If correct me if I'm wrong, but Miss Marvel is one of the stars of the Avengers game, Oh, yeah. Right? No, she freaking carries, I mean, she doesn't carry it. I will say with all the technical issues going on with that game um, that have sort of been ironed out and then not, and then they just introduced Kate Bishop, so essentially Haley uh, Steinfeld's uh, upcoming character in Hawkeye as well. Um, but yeah, Kamala Khan is a freaking highlight of the game. Uh, I think the, voice actor who came in for that show was amazing because she's with titans of voice acting you know in that game with nolan north and um uh troy baker and um and others but anyway yeah uh, that character is great is is really really fun kamala khan's uh just a really cool awesome character it's great to see her and um i was in this i was scrolling through i lost the other one i was gonna pull up not just kamala khan but um the other lady who's going to be introduced in Guardians, is it? Uh, Miss Marvel's Kamala Khan. And then I'll have to scroll back through. God, you lose track of it so fast. But yeah, Ironheart was interesting because like when, I mean, whenever, when all the stuff went down, I think what was interesting to hear about um, with uh, sort of this idea of the post Iron Man void, you can get to touch on a bit with the Spider-Man far from home but now we see disney plus has plans for armor wars iron you know iron heart which i mean it's, it's cool i'm not a massive massive iron man fan i rewatched the original trilogy recently and and liked it more than i remembered liking it but um i guess some of the things that surprised me most about these announcements um were moments like kamala khan we're gonna prominently name drop her bring her in we got you know, for a long time, it had been rumored a Moon Knight show. I'm not a fan of Moon Knight, but that's still interesting. They're going to bring in a, a Moon well, Knight. What surprised um, me is he's been cast already, and they did not announce the casting in that in that show. Oh, in the little blip? Yeah. Yeah. That's if you not... go to IMDb, it says that uh, Oscar Isaac is playing Moon Knight, but they didn't say that, so... That that is weird because Oscar Isaac's not like a nobody. Like you, that's definitely a name you want to throw out in front of some shareholders. The, uh, my my guess is that there might be some con. They, they might have come up with. He's been casting about so many things that maybe there's a <laughs> conflict and they're gonna have to recast. But who knows? Uh, I could see that. I mean, that's another takeaway of this thing is like you're seeing the streaming just throw its weight around with HBO max, like the way they're promoting all their stuff, how they're going to dump their whole slate from 2021 on, on the service. And then like you see how Disney's pulling in all their MCU top tier talent for TV shows, which, you know, back when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties was like the B level stars, you know, battle of the network television shows. It, it, it was always like a lister showing up or only cameos. Well, now a listers are coming to streaming. Like the fact that we're going to have, Loki at Falcon Winter Soldier and WandaVision soon. And then you're going to have a whole secret invasion show, which I'm not even sure how the hell that's going to work without all the Avengers behind it. But if it's written like an espionage show, it could be incredibly cool. Um, and yeah. And, and of course, just the, the movie announcements alone are exciting, but like I have been an unapologetic super fan of the Ant-Man films. I think they are probably some of the most like I love Guardians of the Galaxy. It's super cool. But it's I think it's easier almost for Guardians of the Galaxy to just go off in space and be really cool and different than everything else until Captain Marvel came. Uh, but Ant-Man's been in the same world that everybody else is in, and it still manages to be incredibly different because it it's, sees things from a different point of view. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really excited about that film and and the ramifications that theory boys are already throwing around about 
the big bad for that and and how it could connect to the greater universe but um it's laid out even in doctor strange multiverse of madness like i think the next big phase of marvel is this multiverse thing i don't know if i'm spoiling thoughts it's theories but there are heavy 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 theories that sony is pursuing toby mcguire and andrew garfield to potentially do some form of spider-verse film uh and if that's the case and you're seeing the multiverse established in dr strange and you're doing all this other stuff like i think after endgame a lot of people were like this is amazing but what's next and we've talked about this on the show several times of like you're excited because you kind of go back to the ground and like character focused movies and franchises a little bit and revisiting but like what's the big thing you're going to build up to and if it's a multiverse like smackdown like done by marvel um it could be incredibly impressive and again incredibly overwhelming which is why the the legend series lou mentioned might be again needed content uh for following up on that but uh but yeah i was mostly excited by the the marvel announcements the star wars stuff I think uh, I have some reservations on a lot of it. I think the only thing that I will unabashedly pound the table for is Ahsoka. I think I feel that's mostly the reaction most of us had once once we had that information and, and spoilers aside, some um, big developments with that character. Um, but yeah, I think... Uh, I think that is what I'm most excited about. Um, there's some stuff that's happened in Mando recently that to lay the seeds for other stuff that I'm tentative on. And there's some info here that about the new star Wars stuff that I'm a little tentative on, but uh, I think for the most part, I can hundred percent get behind not only uh, Ahsoka, but probably the acolyte because again, for years, I think Joel, or at least for recent memory, you've been pounding the table for a high Republic show. And I think having that sort of show uh, that's not so tied to, you know, Skywalkers and Jedi. Well, there'll be Jedi, but you know, that sort of thing could be exciting. The the issue, and I know Lou will probably agree with me, is that prequels have a built-in problem in that any peril they put Obi-Wan Kenobi in, as much as I'm looking forward to that show, we all know where he ends, right? No. Because, I mean, that happened in 1970, uh, 77, yeah, right? Exactly. We all know where his end happened. So if any peril that he's in in that show, you know he's going to get out of it. It's a matter of yeah. how. And that can be done well. I mean, like there's the, the for example, um, with the Mandalorian, again, no spoilers here, but the Mandalorian, because it's part of a, it's a part of a big universe that we just didn't see this part of the story. It doesn't matter that they've put it a few years after um, Return of the Jedi and that there's been other films um, since because there's enough time in between there. And because these are not the main canon character, you know, story arcs, there's no Skywalkers, you know, nothing like that. Um, it's, it's really cool to explore that story. And so I'm looking forward to a, a number of the, the, the Star Wars titles, but what I'm really looking forward to is Disney giving Star Wars the MCU treatment, right? It's not, nothing, not everything hangs on the next theatrical release in theaters, right? Like it's not the one thing you get multiple shows you can watch what you want you can not watch what you want there'll be hopefully these little you know these little vignettes where you can pick up and be like oh hey that's kind of cool um for me the whole announcement was it was the everything was key on the fact that kevin feige is taking over everything and he's gonna do to star wars what he did with marvel so all the i think all the stuff that people had gripes about with the new trilogy I felt they just didn't like, I felt like every director tried to make their own film and there wasn't an overarching story. Like they just kept throwing hint pieces out, but nobody they, like they didn't communicate with each other. So we didn't get like act one, act two, act three. We got, we got act one done by one director. Act two director went, I don't like act one. So I'm going to do my own thing. And then act three, it was back to the director one going, how do I make all of this work? And I just, I didn't enjoy any of it. Um, I was excited. And I think it took the wind out of Star Wars a lot. And I think if nothing else, Mandalorian made it brought, is bringing a lot of people back to the fold. And I think Kevin Feige basically went, here's a show about Ahsoka. So you're going to get a Jedi story. We're going to continue with Mandalorian. So we're going to get, the bounty hunter type of story that we cowboy western thing we've been doing oh yeah by the way we're gonna do 
uh, uh, there's a show that's going to take place and be like the New Republic on the rim that's supposed to be a thing. And I think that that's going to end up being our cop show in the Star Wars universe. And like he's doing for Star Wars what he did with 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 Marvel, whereas Captain America has been a spy movie and Ant-Man was a heist movie. And I think we're going to start seeing that in Star Wars rather than everything being a focus on oh, now we get more Jedi, and we're going to focus on Luke Skywalker. We're gonna, it's going to be totally different. Oh, man. If they if they take Ahsoka in the direction of a samurai movie, on board. Like, oh, yes, please. Because yeah. the, thing, the thing that they do so well with The Mandalorian is like, it's a Western, but Star Wars, the original trilogy, is a space Western, you know, yep. for, at least for the first one. Yeah. Uh, and, and I feel like uh, the thing that they get right with the Mandalorian that has me with high hope for a lot of this other stuff is pacing. The movies, the latest trilogy were too fast. It was just like they were trying to bang out the story as fast as they could in like three years or f- six years or however long they spaced them out. Whereas with a series, you have a lot more time. Uh, and and if you're doing any kind of crossovers and if you want these new series to be spinoffs, like for example, Ahsoka being a spinoff of The Mandalorian, uh, for, from a series perspective, you have to then have the people invested. So you can't have them invested in a one-off like blip of a, of a cameo. You can't yeah. just mention a name. You have to actually have some real pathos there. And they did that. Um, I'm most interested in, again, without spoilers in the villain that they hint at for Ahsoka, like that, which is happening that, that hint comes in Mandalorian season two, but like that to me is like, Oh Wow. There's a lot of stuff that was canon that Disney threw out when they took over. Mm-hmm. And to the chagrin of a lot of Star Wars fans, we're like, you know, not all of it's good, but come on. Like some of this was some of our favorite stuff, especially like some people like some of the older novels and things better than the prequels. Um, what I like about what's happening is that you're getting a lot of stuff that's now canon being heavily inspired by this stuff that has been removed from canon novels. Right. Uh, there's a whole, I mean, people are a little bit out of shape because the Rogue Squadron movie, it's not Rogue Squadron, the book series. As good as that series was, you're not going to get that Rogue Squadron because one, Luke Skywalker is dead, you know? Uh, so, and, 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 um, Wedge Antilles is also older than dirt. So, uh, you have to go forward. So it sounds like the new Rogue Squadron, which is taking place after, the rise of Skywalker uh, is going to be in name only. Now, again, director Patty Jenkins, I'm happy to see what she does with it, but um, the, it could be some really, uh, if it takes the spirit, if it takes the, the kind of things that happened in that rogue squadron book series and kind of like folds them into, you know, the, the new canon in its own way, in a way that best fits the story rather than just forcing it in, you know, um, then I think that we're going to have some some cool stuff. Uh, something that doesn't get a lot of attention, but I do want to mention is that Star Wars Visions is an upcoming anime anthology series to Disney+. Plus, and it sounds like it's going to be very similar to Love, Death, and Robots. You know, different directors, different Ooh. short stories set in the Star Wars universe, all anime stuff. So, like, it could be some very pretty, very um, unique stories that, you know, don't necessarily have to be you know, part of the main series canon, like, you know, some what off droid bounty hunter story. Sure. Why yeah. not? That sounds fun. You know, like that kind of stuff could be, could be really interesting. And what if, and they're going to do what if for Marvel. So they're going to do yes. the very popular series and the promo thing that I read says they're going to get top in voice talent. So there's a potential that you could still have um, some of your favorites, um, you know, but do voices and things like that. So yeah, yeah. that, that stuff's really cool too, as well. I know that people do have to, to head out soon, but I want to make sure that we touch on um, some of the animated stuff that's coming because I, I didn't really get into that uh, on the last episode. Uh, we've got uh, Raya and the Last Dragon coming out March 5th in 2021. Baymax, a series based on Big Hero 6, is arriving uh, 2022. Uh, Zootopia Plus is another series based on the movie. Um, Tiana, based on The Princess and the Fog, is coming in 2023. Uh, a lot of the animated stuff seems to be one to two years out. Um, we also, on the Pixar side of things, have uh, Lightyear, which is not Buzz Lightyear the toy, but Buzz Lightyear the character, like the television show that the boy, the toy is based off of, uh, with Buzz Lightyear uh, voiced by Chris Evans. Uh, we've got um, 
uh, was it Luca is a movie coming out later this year in June from Pixar. And it's about a, a small Italian boy of the name Luca and they don't really say anything else. Um, and then you've also got uh, Turning Red, which is about a 13 year old girl going through puberty that transforms into a giant red panda. Um, sure. <laughs> I, I guess. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I just, I, there seems to be some, some fun stuff. I've seen the latest trailer now for uh, Raya and the Last Dragon, and that seems like a really cool Asian fantasy film. Like, it doesn't at all seem like it's meant to be rooted in in history. It's meant to be very fantastical. It's based uh, off and... of a lot of lore, like mythology and things like that. It looks very good. I'm very excited for Raya. I can't remember the name of her little cute companion, but as per mm. kind of like Disney formula, she's got like a cute animal friend. Um, that ends up being the size of a horse later on. Like she rides around on him. Um, but it like, it's, it looks really, really fun and entertaining. And, and uh, I, again, like with the, the way that CG animation is now, like after Zootopia, like they, it, everything just looks really good. You know, like even if frozen isn't your bag, you can't really complain that it looks bad, <laughs> you know? Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really cool stuff there. Uh, I, um, yeah, I just, I'm looking forward to, just the the Disney Plus choices, you know, like the, the fact that they've got so much stuff interwoven, there seems to be something for everybody. And one thing I am kind of curling back from, though, is this premiere event stuff that they're doing. So with Mulan, when that came out back in September or August, um, if you wanted to watch it on Disney Plus when it came out, you had to pay something like 20 or $30 extra mm -hmm. on top of your Disney Plus subscription. Yeah which I am not on board for, especially after this $3 price hike. Like if yep. I'm paying 14 to $15 a month for Disney plus and you want to put it out on Disney plus, then I should be able to watch it. I, that should not be something don't punish me because I don't want to go to theaters during a pandemic. Like that to me is just like, I will definitely not partake. If that's, if that's how you're going to go, I will simply just wait for it to come out on on disney plus now that window is smaller it's between eight and 12 weeks in some cases for some theatrical releases um i think some of these things that have theatrical releases but no information about when it's coming to disney plus are uh that's what i'm looking for optimistic at best uh that i don't think that any kind of anything released in theaters and bef before christmas next year i don't think it's going to do very well I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. I was hoping that they were to announce a, a better interface for it because I really don't like Disney Plus's interface. I don't mind it, but I have to say that I'm not watching multiple things. Like I'm going open Star Wars Mandalorian play like that. I don't really deviate from that. Um, so yeah, like it's been that I don't have that experience. Like, are, what do you are you like when you're browsing cartoons? Like, what's the interface that you? I have a six month hold at home now and trying to find something to put on in the background so that she can focus on something. Cause I can't watch anymore. My little pony. I really, no. <laughs> um, and we've tried like Winnie the Pooh or I'll try to browse and try and find something else and browsing Disney Plus's interface. It's just you, if you click Marvel, it just gives you Marvel stuff. If you click, Disney stuff, it kind of just gives you Disney stuff, but then I'll be looking for something specific and it will be the one thing that it's not listing under Disney. And I'll be like, what? what where do I gotta go find that? I've run into that a few times where I'll be like, oh, this should be under Marvel. No, it's not under Marvel. Well, where is it? No, it's under the gen the general list. Okay. Makes no sense. Yeah. No sense. I've had the same trouble. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you if you don't know what you're looking for, it becomes a little tedious. And the, but in the in the reverse, I don't want them to go their Netflix route, where it's trying to recommend and recommend to you all this stuff that you don't want or don't care about because you watch this one thing, you know, or there's two minutes of this one thing that you didn't like. So um, but yeah, I can I can see that. I I'm looking forward to um, something that I completely forgot of uh, how many of my favorite christmas specials are owned by disney in one form or another whether it's the muppets whether it's uh you know uh animated stuff like prep and landing uh or other things and the ability to be able to go into disney plus now and and get some quick christmas things is it's actually pretty good because previously it's always like i have to remember where i stored that on my hard drive because you can't stream it anywhere and so there's a number of things now that are accessible um on the disney plus side of um christmas cartoons but yeah i if they're going to expand in this way 
I feel like they need to have like a movie section, a TV section, you know, so you can narrow it down. And I'd like them, to, I, I'm surprised that they don't have, do they have, I haven't looked because they don't have kids, but do they have like an age group? Like that they have like, you know, two to four toddlers or anything like that. They don't have any, because there's a lot of Disney stuff that's aimed at like really little kids, like Muppet babies and stuff like that. Yeah, um, we can, um, we set up an account for Emerson as Emerson and it's child setting. So like when you go to her interface, it's slightly different. It's more picturific, but to be fair, I, I agree with Lou for the Netflix. When you go to the kids section, the Netflix is like, is like very like visual, very easy to locate via pictures or whatnot. And their search functions a little bit better, at least in the sense of like Netflix will be like, if you type in, I don't know, the Man of Steel, it will say, well, here are things like Man of Steel. So it lets you know that A, they don't have it, and B, if you're interested in something similar to it, whereas Disney just kind of like doesn't give you anything. But um, but yeah, I think also Disney just doesn't have the original content that Netflix has. So once Netflix really went hard into original content, that's when that suggestion crap came. I mean, like then it was just pounding you with every Netflix original. So Disney Plus by the end of 2020 will probably be pounding you with suggestions. But um, but for now, at least, I, I feel like of all of them, the, I, I, I probably use Net, Disney Plus the most, so its interface I, I'm not as bothered by. Hulu's interface I think is terrible, and that's also on uh, Disney. And um, it gets worse and worse every time I use it. Oh, God, every update with Hulu. It's like, oh, let's put your stuff in stuff, but your stuff will... You have to subscribe to the series, but you can't go to the series page. You have to go to so it's a Hulu is a mess, and it's basically Disney's HBO. Like it's where they dump all the adult crap that they they hide from kids and adults on their family friendly Disney Plus, which I get. But like you have a kids function, I'm a little annoyed that Disney Plus tries so very hard to keep its R rated stuff off of it and leave it on Hulu, and that's fine, I guess. But um, it just means that now I'm stuck flopping to through two different services if i wanted to watch you know whatever new thing is coming to hulu or whatever but yeah interfaces in general are very interesting how they are all laid out i feel out. like I, they're all just getting worse yeah i prime's my least favorite of all of them but yeah they all agreed well get yeah prime is just also prime is tricky because they try and make it seem like you can watch something you click it and it's like you want to buy this and you're like whoa 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 back off you let me click this without me knowing that this wasn't free. Like they have this tiny little tag. This is prime. Otherwise you would have no idea if it's included. So um, hopefully all that stuff gets fixed or probably not. It just keeps getting worse. Like we talked oh, about. It's going to just keep getting worse at one point, <laughs> at one point, like two, three weeks ago, something came to prime and it was something I was interested in. And I was like, Oh, this is the kind of thing I can run in the background while I'm working during the day. And I went to go find it. And I had to go through a layer and then through another layer and then through another layer and then through another layer. And I'm like, and then I even tried just searching for the name of it and it didn't even come up in, 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 in prime search. And I was like, what? And then I clicked on one of the subcategories and it was like, boom, first thing that popped up. I was like, how, <laughs> what? I hate Amazon prime for that. Like the organization is the worst. If I make it, if I add something to my wish list or my watch list because it's because uh, it's Prime this month and it's a free movie, take it off my list when it's not not free. Agreed. Oh yeah, agreed, a hundred percent. I get, I've gotten catfished by that all the time. I'll be like, oh, I can go watch this. Nope, now it's a, like a billion dollars, and I'm like, it, it, it was there last week. Oh no, we took it away last this week. Well, HBO, before I lost it because they launched HBO Max, they did this nice whole bar that said leaving this month. It listed every film that would be leaving. So I could have this last gasp chance to see, oh, I got to watch Alita or Godzilla King of Monsters before the end of this month, or else I won't have access to it without paying for it or finding it on some other service. And that's a nice bar. Like the one thing I will say of my time looking, uh, oh, wait, HBO Max, I don't have access to yet, but, uh, but I put it on my Christmas list because at this point, why not? Every, I could try and get everything else, but, um, I saw an email today. It's coming to Roku. If you're that, that's a, something keeping you away. They they've officially passed a Roku deal. Oh, they did a good deal there. Yeah, we use Fire Stick, which okay. is annoying because Prime's the worst. But we have Fire Stick, so it's like, well, you got us on both ends. Damn you, Amazon. 
That brings us into the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you. The Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite into the member only Discord server, as well as multiple different levels of Discord rewards, things like bonus episodes, Discord roles, that kind of stuff. Patreon count is currently at 21. Uh, I like to try to increase that. Uh, every month. So if you want to be 22, go to patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe and consider becoming a member. Uh, it really does go a long way to help keeping the show going. And I really appreciate it. We don't have a new patron, but Yuri Teraday increased their pledge this month. So thanks very much again, Yuri. I uh, really appreciate the support. Long time listener, actually. And it's been uh, it's fun, fun to kind of keep in touch and have a couple of emails come in. And he, he was kind enough to let me know that he increased his pledge. And I thought it was very, very kind of him. Uh, my pick this week is uh, actually a surprise. I didn't think there was going to be this kind of a sale from Steam for video games. I thought normally it's like a winter sale. Uh, it's typically their boxing week. Um, both Steam and Epic Games tend to have, you know, those kind of like big sales right around the holidays when people have new devices and all that kind of stuff. However, titles like Borderlands 3 are 67% off. Gears 5 is 75% off. Don't Starve Together is 66% off on the Midweek Madness sale on Steam right now. Um, And I just picked up Pillars of Eternity, the definitive edition for free on Epic Games. Uh, It is like a dungeon crawler RPG sort of situation that I've heard lots of about but just not something I was going to drop $50 on but it's free so yeah <laughs> I'm already using Epic Games for Satisfactory so I was on board and uh, Epic has announced that starting today I believe at noontime uh, until after New Year's they're giving away a free game every day for 24 hours Whoa. And, wow. and some of it is going to be big stuff Epic's been giving out free games for a while, and I've picked up a few. Some of them are just like, I have no idea what this is, but it's free, and it sounds kind of good, so I'll just grab it. Because it's like every three or four days, they have a, this is free now, and this is free next. And so, like, whenever you log in, I just kind of take a look to see what's coming. It's like, meh, this is all city builder stuff, or this is all, you know, turn-based card game things. I'm not really interested in that this week, so I'll just check back next week. Uh, But that's good to know, uh, Lou, that they're doing free games every day over the next week or so. I'm not uh, an Epic Games guy, but when I saw the Pillars of Eternity Definitive Edition for free this week, I was like, I do have an account. I might as well log in and get a free game. (laughs) I use it pretty regularly for uh, Satisfactory, which is where... I mean, Satisfactory is now on Steam, but last year when I first got it, it was an Epic exclusive. Uh, and Satisfactory has got a cool holiday update right now where like certain items that you make in the game are like Christmas presents and candy canes and stuff like that. So just kind of a fun thematic thing. I'm probably going to return to Satisfactory next week when I have extra time to stream uh, during some holiday off time. And so that should be pretty fun. But, uh, but yeah, I just I, I don't have a heavy investment in Epic because I think a lot of what I have on Epic because I grabbed it when it was either free or like really cheap. I will probably have access to when I get Xbox uh, Game Pass. And some of them, or most of them, are things that I would really like to experience, like kickbacking with with an, a, tr- a controller. Um, so I don't really want to sit at my PC to play Batman Arkham Knight. Uh, so if I can access that on Game Pass, I'll probably play it on the couch. Uh, but it's nice to be able to have it on the PC should I want to stream it, or, or if I wanted to... Um, or if I can't get an Xbox for a long time, which does look like the case. So we'll, we'll have to see. But that's that's my pick this week. Check out uh, the Midweek Madness on Steam, the Pillars of Eternity on Epic Games. And as Lou mentioned, check out Epic Games for some free games coming out over the next week or so. That wraps up this episode of The Citadel Cafe. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we talked about at thecitadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. And of course, you can email the show in 2021 at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com. These pre-recorded episodes will go out over the holidays, so there will not be anything new being recorded until January. You can find the show by name on Twitter. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. But word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. Just tell a friend or family member over the holidays about the Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything I'm doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can check out the other podcasts I do all about Minecraft at thespawnchunks.com. There will be two episodes of that going out over the holidays. We've been pre-recording those as well. Uh, so there will be no missed weeks over the course of the uh, the holidays for the Spawn Chunks. And of course, you can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and on Twitch, where I do plan to do some extra streaming 
over the holidays. We'll start with you, Brockett. Where can people find you online? At the Catvolver for most social media things. And Lou, where can people find you on the internet? The easiest place to find me is under the name Busy Zombie Lord. And on Zamp, well, we're going to be off till after the new year. Megan, where can people find you online? People can find me online on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, and TikTok at Townsend. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap. But you can only pick two. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.